Hey everybody, this is Jackie Lewis, and this is a special mini-series of Love Period, in which we're focusing on Black History Month. Of course, you and I know that Black history is American history, but my guests are going to bring special perspectives about what it means to be Black in America in these days. And I hope you enjoy these conversations. Hi, Kaliswa. Hi, Jackie. Oh, wait a minute. Did you pitch your voice down? Is that what I happened did. Right I did. I moved to my, uh, my recording voice. <laughs> a little sultry. I like it. All right. Meet me here. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I mean, my default answer is great, but it's not, I mean, I'm not, no, I don't have any tragedies going on, but I just sort of woke up a little bit. Actually, I think I woke up fine and then had some day-to-day bumps that made me feel like, mm, so I'm a little mm right now, but happy mm-hmm? to see you. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to see you too. People can't see us. Thank they God, because I God. look tired today. Do you know why? Why? Because I'm tired. Well, there you go. <laughs> A plus B equals C. I'm so tired today. I'm so tired. Are you tired of like the way the world just is full of funky, political, clashy, angry? Mm -hmm. Not enough love, Mm -hmm. Kaliswa. Not Not at all. Enough love. Actually, last night, off topic from what we're talking about, but yesterday, I should say, I got a notification while I was recording um, something that there was a shooting in Washington State, where I'm from. And I was like, oh, every time you see that, you're like, oh my God, where? So I go and I look it up, and it was in Richland, Washington, where my immediate family isn't, but I was born there, and I have some family there. And I texted some family, and turns out my cousin was in the Fred Meyer where there was the shooting, and she had to hide in a locker for, like, hours. Are you Um, kidding me? No, and she's fine. But I was like, this is insane that this is the world. Like, I, I always knew that it was just a matter of time before the way that things are going, the way we don't have a lock on gun control. It was a matter of time before I was, like, one degree from it or someone in my circle but it's wild that it happened. Now she didn't, you know, she she survived. She's you know, I don't know psychologically and emotionally where she is, but she's unscathed and um one person was killed and a police officer was hurt. But I do not understand a world in which I found out she was fine and then I just am like, okay, and then I go about my day like as if a shooting didn't happen to someone who was just in a grocery store, you know? Like that's but that that to me encapsulates where we are. When you say, "Are yeah. you tired?" Yes, but I feel like I'm so tired that I don't even I can't I don't even process all of the things that are happening because if we processed it all, we would fall apart. It's not normal to have this much chaos and pain all around us. You know that that's exactly how I feel, sweetie. That's exactly how I feel. Before we got together for this conversation. And I have permission, dear listener, to call Calis Sweetie because she's my little sister. I'm her yes. pastor. And yes. I just, I roll that way with her. So that sweetie is not sexist or anything. Okay? No, it's a consensual uh, it's sweetie. It's a consensual sweetie. Yes. Um, when, I, when I was, you know, scurrying to get to this call with you, this conversation with you, my brain was so hurting. I, I'm not tracking things today. Mm. You know, I looked at my clock at one point. I was like, okay, yep, I'm going to eat this sandwich and da, 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 and then suddenly it was you know 5 minutes into the time I was supposed to be with you and that time just went into Kaliswa a flurry of emails in response to a flurry of emails mm-hmm. in response to a flurry of tweets in response to a flurry of posts of just personal inconvenience and collective trauma I had so many conversations today in which everyone is saying I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're supposed to set a little table today for not okayness. I think that's, I mean, I would really appreciate that. Like, as opposed to what we all often do, which is like, uh, dust yourself off, get up and charge, you know, like um, at a certain point that, I don't know, what's the word? Um, That's a bit delusional, I think. It is. It's how we're wired. And I know you're very, very wired that way, and I am, but collectively as a culture, even people who wouldn't consider themselves, we are. 
It's part of capitalism. It's part of America. It's part of now this like global world, but it's not working. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's not working. (laughs) It isn't working. It is not working. And, you know, you tell the story of your cousin or your relative cousin um, Mm -hmm. surviving this shooting in a locker. I was home with my family in Chicago um, a little while ago. And my sister prompts, tell Tell everybody what happened to you yesterday, Rodney, my middle brother. Well, there was a shooting in the mall, hmm. and he was one of the people galloping out of the mall, like jumping over other people, getting out of the mall, and grabbing <laughs> ladies and coming out of the mall. And he didn't even tell us. Right. And it isn't that he picked the sibling that he's best friends with. She, he just It just happened to be that day that he said, you know, yeah, I was running from, I was running from bullets today, mm-hmm. and, and Wanda held on to it. And we talk all the time, and he didn't even mention it what i mean is it was so ordinary somehow that it didn't come up yeah and well, conversations, he didn't get hurt so it's like there's get, nothing so to say like, exactly right right oh my god and you know we're, we're curating these episodes uh as a as a talk about black history mm-hmm. and black present i'm gonna say and black future and just on top of all the things, it feels to me that there's a particular kind of dripping, 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 dripping about being black mm-hmm. in America, too. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about how people can be in their apartments and get killed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I think, like, a question is, like, how... Well, I guess there's two questions and maybe they're part of the same. And I don't know which direction to go in. Like, cause it's, how do you, an- how, there's a human question. And then of course there's a black question. Mm-hmm. And then the questions are survival. Mm-hmm. And then the questions are also like, is there a way to live that's beyond survival? Like, mm-hmm. is there a way to like thrive and live into what you would call like our own divinity, like our mm-hmm. birthright of life? Beautiful. And it feels like we are surviving. And I know I, I just, I get curious because obviously this isn't the only dark time in the world. And beyond that, this isn't the only, there are, I've lived a pretty, we've lived, I know you've been through things, I've been through things, but we've mostly been in the United States. Right. And for the time that we've been alive, there have not been bombs blowing, there have not, we've not been running right. for shelter, you know, right. we've had incidents, right. things have happened, but it's not like we were in Afghanistan, right. you know, so there's still a certain amount of like sheltered and privilege. Although this is a different kind of violence, Yes. That this like drip, drip, like you say, or every day terrible things happening, but there's enough normalcy going on that you can push that stuff to the side and be like, well, what do I want for my career? How do I want my family to be? What house am I moving into? And focus on those things as opposed to the world is sick. Yeah. And almost, I mean, just to circle back to the very top of what if we set a table today for the not okayness, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I don't want to be shiny, sparkle, Jackie, everything's okay, Jackie, in the face of all the stuff. Yeah. I've, I feel called to truth about it. You know, that's what, that's what we write about in Fierce Love, that whole idea of truth-telling as an act of love. And I feel so sad, Kalispa, today. Like, I, I, I'm so glad to see you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel sad that Amir Locke is dead and there's a shooting in your hometown. I saw that today originally. And I thought, is that your, that's your town? Um, it's where, um, it's not my town. I was born, born there and I have family right. there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because mm-hmm. I was listening to another uh, recording of you earlier today, proof mm-hmm. texting it. Is it right? Is that what she said in this other mm-hmm. podcast? And you described that little girl oh, in that town. Yeah. And the friends, the super friends of the first generation friends you talked about in that in that room. I just I just don't want us to be these people, Kalispa. I don't want us to be these people where whatever you would gain from using a key to go into somebody's house, which means you had collaboration to catch them at something, that whatever you would gain that it's okay for them to die to gain it is just a world that I don't want to be yeah. in. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to yeah. be in that world, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to be in that world. But it feels like your solution is, well, actually, let me not put words into your mouth. Um, 
who I know you to be, and I don't know how you are evolving or changing how you approach these things, if you are. But, you know, we say a million times, you've said it a million times, you're the one who runs into the fire. Yes. Are you tired of running into the fire? Yes. Wow, that is big. That's huge. That's, whoa. <laughs> like, whoa. Wait, what? Wait, I'm tired Jackie. of running. I know, I'm tired What of does that mean? I don't know. And, okay, <laughs> that is I huge. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. If I wanted to, if I was going to work with you on that metaphor of running to the fire, I, I feel like I don't want to run in the fire. I want to make the fires stop, and that's different. I, I feel like running into the fire means there's going to be more fires. You're going to run into that one too, and run to that one too, and run into that one too. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out if I can use myself differently to make there be less fires. I, this it feels makes me feel teary to say that to you. I'm getting teary too. It's like. Please, could there not be more fires? Like, what? The f- mm-hmm. What? I don't want there to be fires mm-hmm. anymore. I'm so tired of the feeling that fire is normal. That's what I'm saying, babe. Like, what are we doing that there's a fire all the time? What are we doing that the media keeps broadcasting the fires of hatred and pain and brutality? 900,000 people dead of COVID, right? just broke, poor, struggling people and a nation intent on brutalizing rights of people. And Mm -hmm. what is going on? When we say we have, we are, this is not who we are. Yes, it is. If we say we've never been here before, yes, we have. And that we are here before, and we do it again, that we're burning books, banning book, banning, banning books, Kaleswa. Mm-hmm. Banning Animal Farm. <laughs> yeah, I know. What? Banning the bluest eye. That's so insane. It's crazy town. We yeah. could, if this was a movie, we, if this was a screenplay, mm-hmm. we could sell it and we could get rich <laughs> on the, Zombie. Yeah, they always say nothing's crazier book-a- than reality, book-a- right? Book-a-li- book-a-lips. Yeah. So what do you call it? Book-a-lips. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Book-a-lips or something? Book-a-lips. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, what do you think? I don't want to run. I don't want to run into the fires because I don't want there to be any more fires. Me too. That's how I feel. But I don't, you know, how do you not make their fires when, I mean, I believe that the cause of this, of course, is macro in the sense that there are systems, mm-hmm. you know, systems in place, whether it's um, policy, governments, all of that stuff, and then racism and Mm -hmm. hatred and Mm -hmm. um, just all sorts of discrimination towards people's beliefs, religions, who they love, all of that stuff. But, and I also really do believe that a lot of it stems from a lack of like self-love. Yes. Which is really such a hard, hard, hard thing. Hard, hard. Yeah. Hard. Yeah, because yeah. we, you come into the world, I feel, and then you come into your country, and then you come into wherever you're from, and it feels a lot of times that there's, like, who you are, and then who, and then there's already a standard of what is good. Yeah. And so all of us are constantly asked to calibrate toward whatever that standard is. And if you don't measure it, there are reasons to not love yourself. And then there can be reasons if you choose to turn that lack of self-love into hate or violence, however small or big, towards other people. Because um, hurt people hurt people. Wounded because people hurt people hurt, hurt people. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I, is there a way to, I don't know, is there a way to get out of that? Um, I know that doesn't sound very, like, macro, and now we're going to heal the world if everybody goes to therapy or finds out how to love themselves. But I don't know, I don't know how to fix the bigger problem. Um, so I turn to, to that. I think it's beautiful that you turn to that. And it's a great segue point, I, I think, for, you know, where we go from here in this conversation. Because, in fact, we the people make the systems. 
The mm-hmm. systems are created by the governments, the systems, the laws, the policies, the complexes that are industrial or hospital or prison or whatever, capitalism. All of those are created by people who then live in the systems and then are broken by the systems and then raise babies in the system and then yeah, more babies sure. that are, you know, so there's a kind of whole interlocking series of things that happen from the, like, the big bang of the person yeah. who's in charge, who hates themselves, who yeah. hates themselves, and therefore creates a world uh, out of self-loathing, right? Mm-hmm. right or just, if it's not as strong as hate themselves, just, like, pain. And I'm going to go, like... So something that has been weighing on my heart just like super heavily is uh, Chesley Christ, um, mm-hmm. who died by suicide um, yep. just a couple yes. of weeks ago. Yeah. And Did you know her? I didn't know her, but I've been following her super closely, yeah. like yeah. honestly, ever since she came onto the scene in 2019 when she won. Mm-hmm. Um and it was like the trio, actually it was four of them, uh, yeah. black beauty queens. It was mm-hmm. the, you know, black Chesley, Miss USA, and it was Miss Teen USA and Miss Universe. And then a whole nother world of the pageants is Miss America. And she happened right. to be black as well. So it was like, yeah. wait a minute, what is going, what is going on? on? Like the world is shifting and there's inclusivity and it's like, you know, so you know, following her star rise. And this is a woman who was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. She, from Wake Forest University, she got her law degree and her MBA the same year and was practicing law. Mm -hmm. Um, In college, she was a track superstar. Mm -hmm. She did pageants because her mother was the, you know, was a Mrs. North Carolina. I think I might be messing up, but she did pageants. And You know, she just seemed to have it absolutely all. She won Miss USA. Nobody had a bad thing to say about her. She's just stunning, bright light, supermodel beauty, but brains, activist, all up about everything. E! Entertainment was extra. No, she was on extra Extra. as a reporter. Like, how does this woman feel like she needs to kill herself because her life isn't worth it because she's in so much pain. Yeah, that's right. How? But the comment, you know, you know, in some of her writings, she spoke about the trolls and comments that she got about, you know, her being black and not deserving, her not really being beautiful, her body type, her hair, which was stunning, like her never actually being enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of like, if she's not enough, what chance do we all have if Chesley Christ isn't enough? And if she believes that lie, then what world are we creating? Yeah. This is the fu- this is one of the fires. One of the ones I don't want to run into, but one of the ones I want to make go away. Yeah. Like, I, I think, and listen, Kaliswa, you know, Regina King's son, I mean, mm-hmm. who knows what's happening with that seemingly good life and that place of despair that causes a person to die by suicide psychologist might say I, this one might say this psychologist might say that sometimes we have such a disconnect with the false self with the presentation that everyone's seeing mm-hmm. that we want to kill that presentation like we want that presentation to die hmm. and we feel like the only way to, for that to die is for us to it's, it's, it's you right you can't mm-hmm. kill it Donald Winnicott would say that that false self sometimes causes us so much pain that we think the only way out of the pain is to kill that false self. But in fact, the only way to kill it is to kill ourselves. Mm. It's, a, it's an escape from the falseness, from the bullshit. Mm-hmm. I would love to dream a world, and I think you do this with your creativity. I think you do this with your art. I know you hate saying that you're an activist. I'm going to go, okay, you're not. But, mm-hmm. but this 
place of telling stories that change the story or the place of enacting something that helps people go, oh, I can do that. This is what I think my calling is. Mm -hmm. It isn't so much now run into fire, but how do we change this story so that there's not so many false selves and so much pain? Mm -hmm. And I think you do that. I think Cicely Tyson did that. One of your yeah. heroes, heroes. Yes. Let's, let's just talk about that for a minute. Let's talk together a little bit about black art mm -hmm. creating life. You know, black art creating true self, authentic self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she's definitely one of my heroes. And I didn't know how much of a hero of mine she was until after she passed and I got my hands on her book. And I, I, you know, as you, as you just said, I really wrestle with using things like activists for myself or, you know, social justice warrior, any of those things, they don't feel right for me. Like mm -hmm. I, I think because I have such a deep admiration for people like you and one of your mentors, Ruby Sales, who mm -hmm. truly like have put their lives on the line and, or dedicated their lives in a very like tangible way to making mm -hmm. the world a better place and, and civil rights really being something that you have fought for. So, you know, I'm sitting over here like I'm just an actor. And to me, the reason that I came to storytelling was because I felt like there was something inside of me that I wanted, some truth inside of myself that I wanted to share with the world that I couldn't just as myself. And there were mm -hmm. stories that I wanted to tell that I thought would open people's hearts up. And this is from a yeah. little girl. But when I read Cicely's book, one of the things that she talked about is when she was cast in Sounder, which was a difficult road for her to be cast in that. And they were doing a tour and people had been watching the film. And a couple places, people would say, oh, it was a good story, but I just didn't believe it. And they would say, why? And she would say, because that was a loving relationship between a black man and a black woman. And, and that's yeah. not real. That's an imaginary thing. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, and that became her mission as an actor artist was to change lives and minds through each and every role that she took, mm -hmm. making sure that everything that she did turned the dial towards people seeing the humanity of Black people. Right. And if you look at her career... From yeah. everything that she did, whether it was like a deep film or something more commercial, she never really did. <laughs> she never did trash, but some things, you know. Right. Um, everything that she did was showing us a more full human version of a Black woman than we had seen before at every right. stage of her life as a woman. Right. That's right. That's right. And inhabiting with her beautiful... Do you remember when... when Maybe it was right before she died. I felt like there were posts up in the world about her. It, it made me post myself in my Cicely Tyson looking. Yeah, so I remember I love remember that? that. I was like, I am Slee <laughs> with my yes. short crap afro. I and, love that. Um, she's just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Um, and just to be honest, love, you know, as a chocolatey brown girl growing up, her chocolatey brown self with her overbite and her big eyes. You know, people said I looked like Diana Ross. I got stopped in bathrooms, you know, are you are you Diana Ross? That's how that's wow. how much my face was like hers when I was a younger girl. And I used to think to myself, Diana Ross or Cicely Tyson. Okay, I'll take both. Just wow. beautiful women, right? I yeah, no. Into, right? <laughs> no bad but, choice there. No bad choice. But but that just the way that she inhabited the world, the way these the way she inhabited the world changed the stories too, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wanting to ask you something that might make you annoyed, but you inhabit the world in a certain kind of way. Do you ever think of how you are changing the Black story by the way you inhabit the world, meaning the Black present and the Black future, Kaliswa? Do you think about that? If you could see her now, her eyes did that really big way up, looking way up for the answer. I'm like, was it up there? Is it, there? <laughs> is, is it behind me? Where's the answer? You can look under my desk. <laughs> she went on a search with her eyes for the is answer. Is it in the laundry pile that's over there that you can't see? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. 
Um, I think a lot. I do. I mean, I've always thought about what m- what my story is ever since I came to this country and realized I was black. <laughs> like, um, can you just like since- pause there because everyone doesn't know what you mean? But like, you came here. Yes, as a three year old. Uh, yeah, as a three. Yeah. I was born here, and then um, my mom sent me to Liberia, where my grandparents raised me until I was about three, a little over three, and then I moved back here. And uh, my gr- and then I was introduced to my parents, and they raised me. And suddenly, I was in I was not in Liberia, West Africa, where there are black people and loving people all around me. And I was in the Seattle area, Bellevue, Washington, where there's was a lot of white people. And suddenly, having to go to like a preschool um, Montessori school with just white kids, and just realizing my otherness, and I, that was just one of the most traumatic shifts. Losing my grandmother, who had been around me forever, she went back. And I was just with my parents who loved me and were awesome. But it was like, what is this new world? What are these white people? Something is wrong with me. I don't look like these people. Um, So that, you know, I used to sit under the stairs at Montessori and cry like every day. I I don't know if it was a combination of my own. You know, it's like a funny thing even for a kid looking back on it now. Because, you know, it's like sometimes you're like, is this racism or is this me? You know, like I have that as an adult. <laughs> like, was that person, was that cashier being racist or am I sensitive? And sometimes it's their racist and sometimes you're having a bad day and you don't know. And when I go back and look at the story of, I used to cry under the thing, there were all the white kids. And I don't know how much of that was my own whatever insecurity as a little baby and how much of it was they were treating me strange because I was a little black kid out of nowhere. I don't know, but regardless, I suddenly had an awareness that I'm black and nobody was having, you know, my parents weren't like black is beautiful at home. That's just, they, they're immigrant. They're not doing that. Like, so, (laughs) you know, like I had to like be taught that black was not awesome and then move through my life. And a lot of my teens and early twenties, like believing that and then having to deprogram that. So Um, let me say that back. You got programmed that it's not awesome. And then you had to unlearn that and learn how awesome it is. Yes, exactly. And now I think it's awesome and I'm so grateful. I don't want to be anything but a black woman, you know, but that's not the story my entire life at all. Um, And, And it's not the story. It's not the American story, right? It's not the American story, but depending on where you are sitting, you can think that is the American story. You can, right. or you can think that there's something wrong with me if I don't have the background or the culture that people think as traditionally African American, whatever ah, that is. And then I you realize you there is no traditionally African American. There there's more than are one black. black. <laughs> there's way more than one black. Right. You know, right. even in a household, right. there's more than one black. That's right, close one. But I did not understand that for a very long, very long time. So I think the first step for me was owning who I am as a Black woman Mm -hmm. and feeling that that deserved space in this world, that I didn't have to shift myself into any other type of Black to be good. Amen. That feels to me like the beginning of a revolution. revolution. So this woman named yeah, mm-hmm. this woman named Can- Candace Bimbo, um, who wrote, wrote a book called Red Lip Theology. You gotta get you know we gotta. Oh, read that, that sounds book like together. your theology. It's totally like I'm like, why did you steal the title of the book I was gonna write next? <laughs> She's lovely, but she writes about you know kind of really finding herself, you know, finding herself in in the context of Black Church. You know, it was her quest, if you will. Like, can I Mm -hmm. find my real self in that? And like, can I find my real self, Jackie Lewis with her hands raised, in the context of Lewis family dynamics, where I'm supposed to be shiny, perfect, and beautiful, and not have any issues, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No issues for you. No. And and can you find yourself, Kaliswa, in the context of how many different Blacks there are? And as a, I'm going to say beautiful, if you all don't know Kaliswa, look her up and see that she is beautiful inside and out. And brilliant inside and out, but like you probably were not black enough in some ways at some point in time for the way you mm-hmm. talk and be all 
sparkly and happy. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, whatever. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, for sure. When I was like, with Chicago the first time and the kids were like, you talk like a white girl. I'm like, okay, do I look like I talk like a white girl? Yeah. Do I look like a white girl? Even close. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that how you be and what it is. I'm thinking about Arthur Ashe's tennis playing self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. more like, what kind of black tennis playing weasel are you? Yeah. You know? All the ways we are black, all the different ways that we are black, can be problematic for a white racist nation, mm -hmm. but sometimes problematic for each other. Completely. And I right? said, so, yes, it it's is. It's a sad absolutely. thing because it was true. It's hard, but yeah, right? It's true. It's absolutely yeah. true. And I don't like, it's just such a, I don't know, not being able to recognize the truth in someone else, but I think it's because you're threatened by them. Like, if she gets to be Black too, what does that say about me? Right. And I think there's just so much work that we have to do as Black people, no matter what our background what? is. So much to understand dynamics, even if you, you know, even if you, no matter where you're growing up from, you have to understand how someone may be judging you when you're walking down the street. If you don't understand that, you're asking for heartbreak all the time. Because yeah. you're going to be disappointed when you smile and that person is like, oh, I'm scared. Let me clutch my bag, you know? Right. Um, right. And it sounds like, I mean, I don't want to put words into you, but I know that like one of the first times I saw you, in addition to your preaching being amazing and exactly what I needed, I was like, I get her. You know, like, yes. I understand that woman. Like, <laughs> I know. And I you, know. Don't, you don't have your quirkiness on full display when you're preaching, like you tone it down a bit. But I was like, I saw enough to be like, oh, she's quirky. She's quirky. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> the quirky in me recognizes the quirky, the quirky in you. In Namaste. You. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love that. I was like, I love this quirky black woman. And, yeah. you know, like, and it was an example for yeah. like, I mean, not that I was trying to imitate you, but it was an example that someone a little bit further down the road, yeah. like, can hold space and be and be unapologetically herself. And yeah. I think the issue for me growing up was I didn't have in real time around me examples like that. Oh, you know, so that's one of the reasons why I treasure you oh, so much. See how she gets there? She loves me. <laughs> I love you too. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> I, too, feel in the Kaliswa dynamic, a, a mirror, a twin, a, a understood, you know? Yeah. And I think my my hope, as we don't run to fires and to fires, because they actually burn you, um, you can see, see yourself, uh, you can die running into the fire. But the way I want to extinguish fires, Kaliswa, in my life, is to make more space for black people to be the black they are. Yeah. And I, I mean, just like... You know, I'm not a Monty Perry black. I love you. Mm -hmm. I love a Monty Perry, but I'm not her. I'm me. Right, right. I'm not Lisa Sharon Harper black. You know, right. I'm not her. I'm me. I'm just doing some women. You know, I'm not um, in Hannah Jones black, although I want to be because I love those. I love her work. I'm me. I, Melissa Harris Perry, you know, my friend and me. And so how can we be, can we be more generous, Kaleswa, to to be to let black people be black the way they're black rather than run into fires i want to extinguish the fire mm -hmm. in which black people can't be their rich beautiful badass selves every day mm -hmm. more ways black like all the black ways the black classical pianist ways the black you know yeah ngawa way the black um I can cook like up a storm way. The black, I'm beige black. I'm biracial black. I'm mm -hmm. all the blacknesses that are the full spectrum of who we are as humans. I just want there to be more space. I agree more with space. that. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think in, in some ways, so I was, I was listening, you know, I, I tend to listen to like a podcast or something when I'm getting ready in the morning. And I was listening to, Brene Brown on one of her mm -hmm. podcasts and she was talking about comparative suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that can happen in all sorts of different ways. So for starters, I feel like it's not like 
this wish to accept all blackness is just saying we want to see each other as people. Like, exactly. That's, just that's the way what it like, is. I can look at a <laughs> white Karen and be like, oh, that's Karen. And then that's white Betty. And that's, I'm not seeing like, oh, that's redheaded Betty. She must be better than, you know, right. or that's exactly. Betty with a college degree. She must be different than Betty who plays basketball. Right. You know, like, like, you know, what is the, can you see the human? Yes. First. Beautiful. Yep. Um, but yep. then again, like, and, and, to, to say, it's not as though this isn't happening. Like, as an adult, most of my close friends are Black women. Mm-hmm. And that's crazy, considering mm-hmm. where I grew up and there was nobody Black except if they were related to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's crazy beautiful because I find it so comforting to be in a sisterhood, with mm-hmm. other black women. And and um, the reason I refer to the podcast as well is because they were talking about, you know, like Holocaust survivors or um, people who go off to war and come home and how there can be such community and a feeling of being held when those people are together just playing cards or right. playing yes. a game because they don't have to talk about the thing. They right. can just be people. That's right. That's you don't right. have to like discuss your trauma you right. can just be like, oh, we're watching a movie, not like, you know, we're talking right. about Black Lives Matter all day, every day. I, and I think when you're saying you don't want to walk into the run of the fire all the time, that's making me think, when can we get to a place when we can just be? Yep. So we yep. can just live. I yes. can dream. I can write. I can go for a bike ride. I can be free. Not yes. be here all day being like, I'm a person. Hey, guess what? I'm a human. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, hey, exactly. this is like my life matters. <laughs> you know, like, like, just let you know, like, in case you didn't, because it seems like you don't. <laughs> right. Because you're killing me I all the time. I just want to be. <laughs> yeah, want to like look, smell a flower. A human. <laughs> yeah. Look, is that okay? Doesn't seem okay right now. In the black future. How you know how you will you know you're in the future? Because black people are just being <laughs> they're just here. That's how we'll know. We're they're just, just people. Here. Just like everybody else. Just a person. You know, that's all. That's no my goal. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Listen, that feels like a good place to like a good hope to live to leave ourselves on. A good place to stop, maybe. But you know, I love to ask you, um, you know, what do you know for sure about love? And I know you tell me that before, but I bet you know something different now. So what what do you know for sure about love? <laughs> <laughs> this is Jackie Lewis that are interviewing best folks. <laughs> what? I know I love you. <laughs> Let's start there. Let's start there. Okay, good. No, I really do think that love and any expression of love and whenever I feel loved or give love, I drop into the present moment. I stop Mm -hmm. living in fear. I stop. I do that thing where I can actually be and live Mm -hmm. whenever there's love. Love is absolutely freeing. And I think the absence of love is death. That's beautiful, Kalisma. And when I say fierce love... What comes up for you? Maybe in the context of Black history, Black future, fierce love. What comes up for you? I think that this thing that Black people have been able to do all over the globe, and when you think about this country and the 400 plus years of survival, um, that Black people, despite Everybody telling us that we are not beautiful, that we are not competent, that we are not human. There's just is this deep, deep love, like the love, love, love that comes through singing, that comes through your mama braiding your hair, mm-hmm. that comes through shea butter on your skin, mm-hmm. that, that comes through like we may not have everything, but these are the ways that we can love ourselves. You know, and I think that that is a fierce love, the love that's strong enough to survive people trying to take your human away. That is some fierce, that is some fierce love. Ooh, yes. I'm going to steal that. Okay, please. For my sermon soon. <laughs> <laughs> Calissa Brewster, I love you so much. I love you too. I love you. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Love Period, a special series we put together for Black History Month. As an African-American woman who grew up in this nation, I think about the poet James Weldon Johnson, who says about my people, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. I think about the tears of my ancestors watering the soil of America, tears baptizing my hope, tears that are often tears of joy because we've learned how to make a way out of no way. Black history, Black heritage, it's everyone's history. These stories belong to all of us. And I hope because you've listened to these episodes, you feel connected and that you'll dig and do some research about Black folks in America.